Jeffrey, David, I want to thank you all for picking this panel. I know there's a lot to choose from out there, so we're glad you're here. Uh, it's an honor for me to um, be with all these panelists today because they are my favorite kind of people. Inspirational leaders focused like laser beams on the only thing that really matters, solutions. The true cost of American food in 2016, I think, can best be summed up by two recent headlines. The first, diabetes rises fourfold over last quarter century. And the second, there are now more overweight people in the world than underweight. And nowhere is this fact more evident and more disturbing than amongst our most vulnerable citizens, children. We have done a terrible job protecting them from the insatiable ambitions of global food companies who want to turn them into lifelong customers, irregardless of the consequences to their health. Now to do this, children are relentlessly pursued by food and beverage companies targeted directly on their devices and in their neighborhoods, pounded with every trick of the trade with no moral regard for their vulnerability or innocence or lack of understanding. It is not a level playing field. To sell cereal and soda and junk, companies use a whole host of tricks like animated cartoon characters and product placement, deceiving labeling, bright packaging, beloved celebrity athletes, rock stars, and faux giveaways. They aggressively lobby Congress to protect their right to market to children and to protect their market share. And I think one of the low marks for society was surely when Congress decided to accept pizza as a vegetable. Food and beverage companies fund nutritionists, fitness trainers, the Boys and Girls Club of America, the Girl Scouts, school scoreboards, and cafeterias every day, every week, every month, all year long. The true cost of food in America has everything to do with our culture and food environment that is constantly promoting and offering food that is making its citizens sick. And as a result, we have a worldwide emergency, and the poster child of this crisis is literally an overweight kid. It is increasingly urgent that we arm our next generation with the skills and tools and information and truth they need to combat the dark forces swirling around them. And the good news is that all of the superheroes on this panel are doing just that. So let me introduce them. First, we have Angela McKee, who is a project manager for San Francisco's Unified School District, which serves over 66,000 students, three meals a day, every day. And with that beautiful opportunity to feed and educate so many kids, they are revolutionizing not only the food itself, but how and where the students eat it. Next, we have Richard Dunn. He's the principal and headmaster of the Ashley School in the Thames Valley, England, where he oversees elementary school children ages four to 11. And it is here that Richard looked closely at what school lunch should be and had the vision and inspiration to do something fantastic about it. Ted Smith is the executive director for the Institute for Healthy Air, Water, and Soil and works on the Compassionate Schools Project in Louisville. Here they are examining the whole student, mind and body, and coming up with some powerful and important conclusions. Last, but clearly not least, is the esteemed Alice Waters. And I wonder if she ever gets tired of hearing how amazing she is. Do you, yes or no? No, okay, she doesn't, good. <laughs> Alice is truly adored all around the world for her early leadership on organic, sustainable food and her visionary and groundbreaking launch of the Edible Schoolyard back in 1996. Alice has the radical notion that there should be free lunch for all students 
and food education is as critical a subject as math or English. And I would even argue more critical because I know I cook every day, but I have a calculator on my iPhone, so I don't need to know math. Anyway, let's dive right in because there's really not a moment to lose. Um, each panelist is going to give us uh, some opening remarks about their revolutionary programs. We're going to leave here incredibly inspired. And uh, let's begin with Angela. Angela, tell us what a school district can do for its students given the will to improve the terrible state of school lunch. Borrow this one. Can everyone hear me okay with this? Okay, great. Um, so, as Lori said, my name is Angela McKee. I'm the project manager for SFUSD's Future Dining Experience. We're an initiative of Student Nutrition Services. And so, um, a little bit closer. Directly into it? Okay. I'm a hand talker, so this is a little difficult for me. So, um, if at any point you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, so, we serve over 35,000 meals a day across 115 school sites. Uh, about 61% of our students qualify for free and reduced price lunch, which is a pretty large amount of our students. Um, and it also means that a lot of our students are relying on us for the majority of the calories that they get throughout the day. Um, before I dive into the work of the future dining experience, I kind of want to explain where the district was and how we got to where we are. Uh, so a few years back, we were shipping in frozen meals from the Midwest, and our students weren't eating. They didn't enjoy the food, and they just weren't consuming it, which was a huge problem for us, um, because we all know that hungry students have a really hard time learning. And so if our kids are undernourished, that means they're underperforming in the schools as well. And so in order to fix that problem, um, over the last 10 years, we've actually done some pretty big steps to change how the food and is being served within the district. Our Board of Education passed the Feeding Every Hungry Child resolution, which meant that every kid, no matter if you could pay or not pay, was entitled to a lunch. Um, we also passed a really strict wellness policy, um, which is actually goes beyond the he Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, uh, meaning that um, we've removed competitive foods from our meal line, so the meal experience is more equitable. So if you had a dollar to pay for a cookie, um, you don't have that chance anymore. Uh, everyone can eat the same meal, which just tries to like get everyone to get to our nutritious meals. Um, and then we also removed sugary beverages and high fat, low nutrient foods from our vending machines, which is a huge step. I think the biggest thing we did, uh, we got rid of those unitized meals from the Midwest and partnered with Revolution Foods. Revolution Foods is actually an Oakland-based company. Uh, they prepare our meals fresh uh, the night before and bring them in in the mornings. And um, one of the key things about Revolution Foods is that um, they provide us with antibiotic-free meats. Um, their foods have no artificial colors or preservatives. And um, they use a lot of local and regionally grown um, crops. And we have wonderful things like masa organic rice and stony-filled organic yogurts. Um, so we really elevated the types of food that we're serving our students. So we changed the food, and um, we asked our students, what else can we do for you? And they said that the experience was a major deterrent to them eating. And you know, think about that. You could have a delicious lunch that we had today, but if the space was gross and looked terrible, you know, is there any draw to actually stay here and eat it? Um, and so through a really generous grant from the Sarah Nevin Williams Foundation, we were able to partner with IDEO, which is a de design and innovation firm, to reimagine our school food system. So from that engagement with IDEO, uh, we interviewed over 1,300 members of our school community, including the students, which is key here. Uh, we have a student-centered design um, to come up with 10 design recommendations. So as the project manager, it's my job to implement those 10 design recommendations throughout the district. Those de design recommendations go from thinking about what the space looks like. So we're completely reimagining and redesigning the cafeteria to make it more enjoyable and inviting for our students. And I actually have some photos, but I'm not sure if we're do you mind if I hop down and push through real quick? Oops. Ah, there we go. Um, it's been forever since I've used PowerPoint. I'm more of a Mac girl, but we're just going to, how do you press play? Oh, down there in the corner. Or, uh, ah, got it. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to just skip through these first few slides here because this is what I just finished talking about. Um, but essentially, uh, 
These are our 10 design recommendations. So we go from thinking about um, the way the spaces look, how we're sourcing our food, how students gain access to that food. So meal lines were a huge deterrent to eating school lunches. So meaning if you had 20, or excuse me, 30 minutes to eat lunch and you had to spend 20 minutes in line, or go play, which one would you choose as a sixth grader? So our kids were also skipping lunch just simply because they didn't want to spend their time waiting in line, which is another issue of equity as well. If you should need a school lunch, you shouldn't have to give up something else in order to be able to participate. So uh, these are our 10 design recommendations, and we're also working on an app within the district in order to engage students through technology so they can pre-order meals, provide feedback, and actually play interactive games um, to learn more about food and learn more about the act of eating. So I just wanted to give you a quick visual. When I say we're redesigning cafeterias and really thinking about our student experience, this is just a quick um, few options here. But this is Roosevelt Middle School. This is our first site. This is what a classic cafeteria looks like here in the States. Um, long tables, kind of uncomfortable, tons of things on the walls, really gross. We worked with student groups, and this is what's key, is that we work with students to reimagine the spaces. I do workshops with students at every school we go to because we want them to create a space that's going to be welcoming and inviting for them, that they enjoy, and that they can feel a sense of community in. So we went from this to this at Roosevelt, different types of seating options because our kids are all different. You might feel comfortable on a kind of a long table, but you might feel comfortable sitting with just a smaller group of friends. Um, this is just a group of students that we worked with at Marshall High School. This is what their cafeteria looked like before. This is what we turned it into. Again, this green paint is all throughout the district. It breaks my heart. Um, but this is essentially um, Everett Middle School. Um, we talked with the students and they said that social justice themes were really key to the environment of the school and they really wanted to bring the mission into their cafeteria. And so we worked with them to create um, graphics that have inspirational quotes from different social justice leaders, as well as doing a mission streetscape throughout the cafeteria. So again, creating spaces that are inviting for our students, that make them want to come into the cafeteria, because I've talked to so many kids who say that the cafeteria itself is the reason why they don't want to eat lunch. It's uncool to go into the space. So if we can change the space, make it more comfortable, inviting, and make the act of eating enjoyable again, um, we can get our students to actually eat the meals that we're investing in, which are really high quality and incredible. Um, and then this is just Willie Brown. It's one of our newer school sites. So again, just making the spaces enjoyable and a learning moment for our students. So this is what we've been working on over the last um, two years now. And um, we have currently funding for 18 sites, but we're working with the school district to get the remaining sites incorporated into our next bond. So that way we can expand this throughout the district so all of our students have a dignified mill experience. And if you're wondering how we're gonna track the results of all this, um, we actually just received, a, well, a year ago, received a $2 million grant with UC Berkeley through the USDA to study the impact of our space redesigns, um, our full mill vending machines and mobile carts, and this app, and also teacher wellness training on student health, wellness, and actually obesity, student obesity. So we're really looking at how changing the school meal experience impacts student health and wellness and desire to eat. Seriously. I mean, if people say it can't be done, it's, it's being done, and it's being done in beautifully. And this whole notion of rethinking everything, not just, not, I mean, the way they're eating and how they're eating it, I mean, it's really brilliant. Um, I have just two quick questions for you. One, you, di you didn't mention time, because a lot of, one, number one complaint you hear all the time is that kids don't have time to eat. Um, so how are you addressing that? And I'm also curious, what kind of resistance um, was put up to make these changes? Sure. So when we address the issue of time, the government has like a mandated, I, I believe it's like 20 minutes that every student has to be able to eat lunch, which to me is way too short. Um, and so, we have to work with every school site in terms of how much time that the school has, um, and we can provide advisement on that. So thinking, let's try to extend the meal period as much as possible. Unfortunately, a lot of our schools are already very time constrained. So through having the full meal vending machine or the mobile cart, we're able to alleviate pressure on the main meal line, spread out the line, and be able to get students through faster. Um, if we time it, the vending machine takes, and again, it's a full meal vending machine, so you can get a completely reimbursable meal from that machine. Um, takes about 20 seconds to do the whole process. Um, and it also allows a student who maybe feels uncomfortable engaging with an adult at lunch or doesn't want to have that social interaction to have a meal that is comfortable and inviting for them. Um, and with the mobile cards, it takes about 
um, I think it was about 65 seconds to complete the whole process of getting a mill. So we're really getting to the goal of trying to be that no student spends more than five minutes in line wherever you get your meal at. So we just really want to decrease that so that you have time to actually sit down, take a break, and enjoy it. Uh, when you think about resistance, wonderfully enough, we have the support of our superintendent, and we also have the support of our students and our parents. Uh, this was not something that was dictated from the top down. It was something that was organically from bottom up as well as top down. So we've met in the middle. Um, we've. I think the idea that we're wanting to feed our students healthier food and wanting to provide them in a space that they can enjoy and feel appreciated and valued in has made this easy for us in some ways. Like we haven't met kids, you know, or folks being like, you should be spending money on something else. I think within San Francisco, we really value food um, and value like the act of eating. And um, we're not taking money away from books. This is grant funded. We're doing separate fundraising for this. Um, so this money is um, for these space redesigns. Um, isn't harming anything else. We're just enhancing the experience. But the idea, again, hungry students have a hard time learning. So by investing in the food, we're investing in our students and their ability to perform. The program just shows so much respect for the kids, oh, so yeah. much respect for food, so much respect for the, the values of it. It's really a beautiful program. Thank beautiful. You. Thanks, Angela. All right, so you ready for a little more inspiration? Because we've got more coming. Uh, Richard, take it away. Tell us about what you're doing. Yeah, use it. Good afternoon, everyone. Into the microphone. I need to use the mic. Can you probably hear me anyway, can you? <laughs> Hello, can you hear me now? Great. Um, good afternoon. Well, just before I start talking about the school and the work that I'm doing in England, uh, just two things that I wanted to preface the, uh, the speech with. Uh, the first is that the last session really talked about boldness. Right at the end, the message was, we need boldness in what we do. Um, and my message to all of you, whether you're in education or associated with education, and we've had a great example already, is, is we need to be really bold about what we're going to do now. We need to have courage to make things happen, to change things actually pretty radically. Uh, and we need to, to waste no time. We need to just get on and do it. Uh, step by step, but get on and do it. The other is that I'm interested that this conference is about food and farming with a reference to things like health and um, workers and so on. But actually, of course, really this is about so much more than that. It's about how life works, how we work, uh, and how we link everything together. So I hope that what I share with you, which is not going to be just about food, uh, puts this in an education context, because it's education that is going to change our thinking around food and farming, as well as many other things. Um, and so I, op I ask you actually just to open your mind to, to what this message is really all about. Uh, because it links into so many different areas. Um, I don't know if I can just um, find the... Uh, shall I, shall I swap? Help you you and just learn how to do it. Because she now figures it out. No, I'm just Could you just find the... Uh, just, gonna just, grab the water. just while that's coming up, um, you heard those of you that were here yesterday from the Prince of Wales. The Prince of Wales, about four or five years ago, wrote this book. It's called Harmony. Uh, and in the book, he tracks the history of civilization over thousands of years. And he looks at how those civilizations really understood the need to live in harmony with nature. Uh, and that their systems and practices, their buildings, uh, their designs, their thinking was very, very aligned to how nature works. And then, of course, we had the Industrial Revolution, and we started to separate our thinking from the natural world. Uh, we created industrial processes, uh, and we have increasingly, in many ways, lost our connection to what's really important. So his message is, we need to find a way to reconnect to what is really important in the natural world, both out there, uh, and what better place to be than here with this amazing scenery around us, but also in here, in us, because we are nature. Can, I, can you just press the, the slides? So, um, so I want to share with you now seven principles that are the principles, if you like, that have come from this book. And I hope they inform a lot of what we're talking about with food and farming, but also so much more. So the first principle 
is the principle of geometry. That nature has a geometry, a patterning, an order to it that is quite remarkable, and we are perhaps not seeing it. So on this first slide, you can see on the left, uh, it's actually some children's work, which is um, Earth and Venus's orbit around the, solar, around the sun in the solar system, uh, and it creates over its cycle of eight Earth years, nine Venus years, a five-pointed star, a five-petaled flower. And that shape and that pentagram shape is the same as the tiny flower, which I took in my garden last week. Uh, it's the same, same form, it's the same geometry. So we can see that our world is a beautiful sphere, and a tiny water droplet on a leaf is also a beautiful sphere. This macro micro of life is everywhere for us to see. It is uh, incredibly beautiful. I think you'll have to press this a second time. So this process comes from the circle. And the circle, as you build overlapping circles, creates shapes and forms, which are the shapes and forms we see all around us all the time. Uh, I went for a run this morning, and there are some beautiful flowers, as you'll know, along the, the trek here. Uh, and these forms of nature, the three-petaled flower here, are seen everywhere. Thank you. So when we get our children to really look at geometry and how nature works and how we work, then their whole way of seeing the world changes. So in my school, our children learn geometry every week in every year group as a starting point for all learning about life. Whether it's local biodiversity, whether it's food, whether it's solar system, it's all part of the same message. Apple example there. And when they're very young, picture on the left, they're doing very simple learning. That's the eye using three circles. On the right, older children creating faces of war, but using the geometry of the eyes to create the face shape and proportions. This little girl in this slide uh, is called Isabel. She knew that on her finger you have a Fibonacci spiral. And she knew that the Fibonacci spiral was also here in her ear. And she was spinning a top. And she spun it and created a beautiful Fibonacci spiral and said, I've created a spiral. It's a Fibonacci spiral and it's the same spiral as my finger and my ear. She's five years old. She understands how life works. So the second principle is the principle of interdependence. The clear message from this conference is we cannot look at food in isolation or farming in isolation because everything is linked. We've heard some great speakers here who've reminded us of the interconnectivity of everything. Just before lunch, we heard about bees. Bees are such a symbol, aren't they, of interconnectivity. We have bees in my school, and our children, when they learn about bees, put bee suits on and go and explore how bees are brilliant at working together to create something amazing. And what's very interesting is when they work with the bees, they have to be very calm and very quiet. And when they uh, when they come back into school, I can always tell they've been with the bees because they whisper as they walk down the corridor. But I, saw, I met an Italian man the other day, and he works just outside Florence, and he has 150 bee, uh, beehives. And I said to him, what have you learnt about bees? He said, that we know nothing. <laughs> we know nothing. So when we learn about bees and interconnectivity of life, um, our whole thinking changes. We see learning together. I don't know if this slide's come through clearly for you, but uh, here are some examples of inquiries of learning in my school where the focus is on linking everything together. Subject silos, like food farming separate, is no way to learn. We have to move education to project-based, inquiry-based, joined-up learning where we learn everything through a project or a theme. When we do that, learning makes sense. The third principle is the principle of the cycle. You know 
that everything in nature is cyclical. Food cycles, water cycles, carbon cycles. We need our children to understand, we all need to understand, that nature is cyclical and it's the best way, the most sustainable way to work. So the best way we do that is with food. We want children, and I know there are some great examples in this room right now, where children learn how to plant seeds, how to grow food, how to harvest food, and then how to share food. So just a quick aside, in my school, our children do family service. They sit at tables of six. The two on the end serve each other. We never have a line like a cafeteria line. They have a glass of water in a proper glass that the children decided was important for their rehydration. And the whole system is managed by them. We feed in food from the site uh, and we try as far as possible. We're about 90% organic now. Uh, so we're really pushing that agenda. So when these children learn how to create food and share food with the community, they're really understanding how nature works in cyclical systems. And at the end of the meal, these children uh, weigh the food waste. They look at what's in the bin. What are we throwing away? What are children not eating? And then we compost and recycle all our food waste. We're noticing now, five years down the line, that if you put compost back on the soil, you'll know this. Obviously, it's creating a barrier to keep the moisture in, and the food grows better. So the children are seeing, right-hand picture, hold on one sec, that the food grows well when we put our own compost back into the system and grow it that way. I'm always amazed by the butterfly. It starts off as an avaricious caterpillar eating, consuming too much. That's where we are potentially in many respects. But then it evolves to an ethereal, enlightened butterfly that lives lightly on the earth. And if we transition in this 21st century in one fundamental way, it is to consume less and live like the butterfly, lightly on the world. So the fourth principle is diversity. Uh, it really troubles me that we have such monocultures of food growing. Because actually, as we've heard already today, diversity in food systems is essential to its well-being. So how can we ensure in our schools that our children understand diversity. This is a wild flower meadow in our school, linking to butterflies and bees, linking into food growing. It all joins up diversity as strength. So we know that children are unique and special, amazing young people, and they are all different. And we need to celebrate that, but recognize that that also goes into another world. So we consciously grow food in diversity. We create local orchards of fruits. Uh, we grow 15 varieties of potatoes because we have 15 classes. Each class has a different variety. They become experts in heritage and varieties of food. Three to go. The fifth principle is health. And we know that all of this agenda is about health. We need to be healthy. Uh, I was fortunate enough last year to go to Patrick's farm. This is him holding up some silage. He said this grass, this silage, has taken 42 years of hard work to become as rich and as healthy as it is. And the soil and the, the, the goodness that grows from it is obviously the starting point. So in my school, this is the final thing that they do. They go to Chamonix in the Alps and they bring together three elements of health, individual, community, and global health into one experience. And we say to them, what do we need to be well? What does our community need to be well? What does our world need to be well? Food, farming, integral to all of that. I won't tell you everything they say, but here's just a flavor of the things that they really understand is important in their education to be healthy. They need to be valued. They need to have a role to play. They need to realize their potential. So the sixth principle is beauty. Our world is incredibly beautiful. And it's beautiful because it has a form and a structure to it that makes it so. Our traditions, 
civilizations, thank you, have always understood that when you replicate the proportions of nature, you recreate beauty. The Greek Parthenon, the uh, ancient Greek vases, Roman temples, and so on, all understood this. So we want our children to learn from nature and recreate beauty in their work. What an amazing thing it would be if instead of test results, the outcome of learning was the beautiful results of children's work. Amazing, amazing work with partners in the community to create on there. The left was the Taj Mahal and the right the solar system. So my question, what is the beauty of that outcome? So final message, and it's the message of oneness. Uh, I was talking to someone last night who lives in Borneo, and she said, we need to remember that we are part of a web of life that is wholly interconnected. We are part of it. What we do out there comes back to us. So food is a perfect vehicle for that. And if we can understand it in a wider context of oneness, then we will see that we are part of something much greater. So last slide but one. Harmony is an active but balanced state applicable to the natural world and human society. When we understand this, then we live sustainably because we live in harmony with ourselves and the world. So there they are, the seven principles of harmony. Prince Charles came to my school last month. In my wildest dreams that this book would become a case study in a school, and now the challenge is to help others, other young people see what these principles are. Thank you. Thank you, I'm sorry. What you're, what you're doing and how, also how you express yourself and how you explain this. It feels like, well, of course, this is common sense, right? But then you realize how few, pe few children are experiencing this. I mean, our, our entire education system is the opposite of this. And it's, you know, it, b both cases that we already heard um, just show us that we have to have vision and we, have to, we need leaders also. Um, but this is how it should be and it's how it must be. So with that, let's hear about compassionate schools, Ted. Great, thank you so much. My hat's off to the PowerPoint crowd. Uh, you have to indulge me, I'm not gonna march you through any PowerPoint. So um, what, what I'd like to challenge you all with is um, something that I think we understand but don't like to talk about very much, which is why children love the Frito-Lay product, the Flamin' Hot Cheeto. It's very popular food. It's very popular. So if we brought a young child in here and said, would you like this or would you like this bright orange flaming hot Cheeto? The Cheeto wins all the time. See, we'll get over it. So I want to use that as a starting point. And we could talk about monster energy drinks and we could talk about all of these other things. But um, rather than get into the sort of the social engineering of it all, I'd like to challenge us all to think a little bit about why that's a rational choice that a child makes. What is that choice? And um, how could our young people be so unable to understand that activity? Okay, so really, if you, if you look at a Flamin' Hot Cheeto, it's a disaster, right? I mean, it's a color that doesn't exist in nature, right? It has to be engineered. It's got every element on the periodic table that's not radioactive. And so it's expecting the human liver to do things that the human liver probably wasn't designed to do, but is capable of, thank goodness, right? So um, I'd like to use that as a starting point because our young people, who will turn into our old people, uh, are not equipped in any way, in my humble opinion, to make good decisions. And the school system is probably the best place to start to uh, equip the cognitive, spiritual function of a person. And we're not spending time on it, as we discussed. That's not at all part of, um, unfortunately, what the education system has become. And so in Louisville, Kentucky, we have embarked on a very bold, ambitious, but also not too exotic project in partnership with the University of Virginia to bring into the school um, essentially a refocusing, a part of the school day where elementary school students are trained, equipped, 
with um, the tools and the kind of uh, focus that's required to make a good decision when presented with a Flaming Hot Cheeto. And so there's really only a couple of elements to this. If you think about it, this is really about refocusing. Remember, there's nothing rational about the decision to pick that Frito-Lay product. And it truly does represent at some level um, a devaluing of their own body that that would somehow be a logical thing to do to adjust that food stuff, right? And so it really starts with a very fundamental understanding of your body, being in touch with your body. Some of the things that drive us to distraction as adults is how we could be so uncoupled from nature, right? That, you know, we, uh, I guess we're waiting for the singularity moment, right? When we all merge with the technology and we can, you know, sort of disabuse ourselves of our biology. And there certainly are people who believe that, right? And so uh, are we that divorced from our biology that we don't even understand the biology, right? Or a monster energy drink would make a ton of sense because, you know, it's just a, I don't know what this thing is. It's my body, you know, I don't know. And we don't spend any time being in touch with our bodies, right? Understanding, thinking about it, understanding how they work. And so a fundamental concept is, you know, stretching, right? Just do you understand how to control your body? And, you know, when you take physical education in school, control of your body is not part of the exercise. It's actually not. It's sort of assumed that you know how to control your body. Turns out a lot of kids, and depending on where you come in the socioeconomic spectrum, have a very difficult time regulating their physiology, a very difficult time. The answer has been the pharmaceutical industry in the United States. And so if you can't focus, if you can't settle down, I've got a drug for you. And you will focus and settle down, or at least you'll settle down. I don't know if you'll focus. So uh, there's an element of being in touch with your body. That's part of the lesson, is spending time on being in touch with your physiology, stretching, simple, what really seem to be very basic things that most people don't do anymore. There's a uh, focus on mindfulness, which um, is a variant in some ways of that, which is how do I focus my busy brain? And remember, young people have very busy brains, right? And um, you know, aren't given the tools by their parents or their iPhones how to uh, truly focus their thinking. And so again, there's a very unthinkingness to picking up the Flaming Hot Cheeto, right? It's a very unthinking thing. And so if we were to think about it for a second, what is it that makes it so exciting to have that bright orange package in front of me? Like, am I that out of control that I can't make a better choice? Like, thinking, right? So mindfulness brings a whole suite of things well beyond food, you know, which, which is really the ability to regulate your cognitive function. Okay, so regulation, it's a, it's a theme here, right? Social emotional learning. And so thinking through situations you're in in school, situations you're in at home, and empowering young people to take more control over things that feel overwhelming. And, you know, we could all benefit from those lessons ourselves, right? We, we get caught up in the drama of everyday life all the time. And in certain parts of our community where there's high violence, it's certainly not helpful to have children exposed to violence with no ability to cope with it in any way and nobody to even know what to do about it, to how to talk to them about it, right? And so if we have everybody learning about their social and emotional well-being and giving them some basic tools for understanding things that can be traumatic, things that can be exciting, um, then that's a gift you're giving somebody for their entire life. And then last but not least is nutrition. And so, you know, if I, if I told you it was important to be in touch with your body and the way your body works, um, it's inescapable that you have to have a date with uh, how do I treat my body, right? What, what, are the, what are the choices that I'm making? Where does my food come from? What are my friends eating? What are, you know? Do, do we spend time at home as a family eating? What are the choices we've either intentionally or unintentionally made? Why is the drive-through window a good idea? You know, why isn't it a good idea? Are we thinking? Are we having the conversations about food that are different than make sure you get your essential vitamins and minerals? Make sure you have the food pyramid in front of you at all, or the food plate, or what do we have now? Um, the very mechanistic idea of it, like, let's have a real conversation about the choice you're making to put something in your body. It's a very personal and important choice, and it's something you should be in control of. And so nutrition in this program is very much centered on that. Think about the food. So 
the Compassionate Schools Project, it's 12 schools uh, starting next year. We're at three schools now, elementary schools, moving up to 12. Uh, because we're partnered with the University of Virginia in a research project, um, it's a, a randomized controlled trial design. So we have another 12 schools that aren't going through the program. And of course, we'll be evaluating them over four years and looking at some pretty specific endpoints in uh, educational, you know, sort of attainment and understanding and uh, behavior issues and all the things that the school district has, you know, is compelled to measure anyway. And we're trying to look at those measures through this lens. And the idea is very much that you be able to take a program like this and take it anywhere in the country. We're the 17th largest public school system in the United States. We have 150,000 students. We're in the middle of America. If we can make it work in Louisville, Kentucky, in our school district, I promise you it scales up and scales down in a very straightforward fashion. So uh, for those of you who want to learn more, uh, Owsley Brown uh, is really the chair of the Compassionate Schools Project. He would be delighted to spend unlimited amounts of time telling you about how great the school is and the program is. Uh, I'm delighted to be uh, in Louisville and, and to be sort of have a front row seat to the, the project. So thank you. Ted, I love everything you said. Um, but I want to ask you when, you, when you mentioned kids um, making better choices, the elephant in the room I mean, we're really sending kids out on a booby-trapped field, you know? I mean, the, the elephant in the room is advertising and marketing. And also that the food is addictive. Like once you, you know, drink that, the soda is addictive and the Cheetos are addictive too. So it's, again, like I said, it's not a level playing field. So, so maybe one of the, another element we need to add to the program or to schools in general is, is education on marketing and advertising so these kids can have a shot at, at resisting. I mean, when a soda is identified with happiness and you see those ads and, and all these other, you know, um, friendship, all that stuff. I mean, and kids at us eight and under don't, can't differentiate between what an ad is or what content is. You know, we have to, we have to address that somehow. Do, do you agree? Yeah, no, I, look, I, I do agree. And I, I would just say, you know, and philosophically, I think there's, to make it just on two extremes, you know, you, you can either, uh, remember when Mayor Bloomberg, you know, nanny tax, nanny, you know, he's the nanny mayor, the soda tax, all that stuff, right? That yeah, um, what we need to do is protect uh, consumers from being exploited and abused by industry, right? Um, that's, there's, there's merits in that argument. I think equivalently, there are merits to the informed consumer, right? And so... I think the world is full of booby traps. You're never going to eliminate the booby traps. I'm just I'm philosophically and constitutionally in that place. So what we believe that we're doing is rather than designing the world around the child and re-engineering the world around the child, we're uh, trying to give the child those tools to understand that they're in control of this. And I know you say that it's addictive and all that, and I, I believe you, but at the same time, uh, let's have the respect for each other to give them the tools to make those decisions. And when we don't give them, and maybe it's about advertising, and it's, I mean, I'm with you, right? I mean, the political process is full of this too, right? So, you know, what is your responsibility as a citizen, as a person, you know, in, in, a, in a community? What are your responsibilities? And what, what decisions do you need to make? And I think, you know, we haven't empowered most of us, you know, correctly. And I think it's been easy to not be empowered. And uh, there are plenty of people that take advantage of that. And uh, so I, I think there's a balance. But for five-year-olds and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds, that's, that's asking, that's a tall order. Yeah, you well, know? But they all have parents who aren't making good decisions uh, yes. in a lot of cases, right? But I just want to say one thing on the nanny state thing, that, you know, nannies are actually are good people, right, who take care of our children. So I don't know how this word got so demonized that this is a, nannies are a bad thing. That just goes to the, not to what you said, but just yeah, that term. Sure. Um, which is used by industry all the time and, and paid operatives to go out there and any kind of um, attempt to do something good in terms of food or whatever, you know, it's nanny statism. But anyway, nannies take care of our kids, so that's good. Okay, we're going to move on to um, Alice Water. Take your microphone up and talk to us about what you want to talk about. I guess the first thing I want to say is that everything that everybody has said fits so perfectly into what I want to say. Um, I've been working at a school in Berkeley um, uh, with a program called the Edible Schoolyard Project for 20 years. Now, I'm a, I'm a Montessori teacher by training. I taught three to six-year-olds. I learned in 
uh, about the program in London. And Montessori, if you don't know, was a, was a doctor. And her ideas, she um, was most successful with children that were sensorily deprived because of hunger or, or because of poverty in Naples and in India. And this was at the turn of the last century. And so I, I really am a very, uh, I, I'm not an incremental change person, as you probably know, that I want it all right and right away. But Montessori believed that you have to win people over. You need to win the children over. It's not telling them what to eat or what to do. You just make something over here that's so beautiful that they can't resist. And then the bad behavior just magically disappears. Now, I've been applying that as well as I can to Chez Panisse for 44 years. And I realized that it really kind of works, that you prepare the classroom or you prepare the dining room. And you're trying to reach people through their senses because these are the pathways to our minds. Smell is why I brought the coriander here and you can all smell it. But it's about it's about seeing beauty, and you were talking about that so, uh, such, a, such a great way, Richard, about beauty. But it's what you're hearing. It's what you're tasting. It's what you're touching. And we live in a world that is really preventing us from doing any of those things. We have really become what we are eating. We're eating fast food, which is the predominant food that people eat in this country. And we're digesting the values of that culture. So we want everything fast, cheap, and easy. And we want everything 24-7 everything available to us. You know, seasons don't matter, you know. It's we're, uh, cooking is drudgery, farming is drudgery. Don't worry about those farmers. Somebody else can do that work for you. You just stay on the subject of buying. We're going to sell you something. You need this to even go out to the park. You need a tent. You need a, you need a backpack. You need to have water. You have to bring things to go into nature. Nature is a little dangerous. You know, it rains out there. And you don't want to go out there when you could be home. So I have tried my very best to create uh, an environment in this public school in Berkeley that is bringing children into a completely new relationship to food. Now, this is a public school with a thousand kids. They speak 22 different languages at home and they're middle school children. So they're sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. So just imagine a probably a pretty difficult group of kids. And we work on the principles, the slow food principles too of Carla Petrini, that we are trying to seduce them. We are trying to make something so irresistible over there. So the way that we do this is by teaching their academic subjects in the garden and in the kitchen. First of all, they don't like to sit in the classroom. So we put them in to bring them into the garden. They like to be in the garden because it doesn't feel like school. They like to be out there. At first they didn't because they, they haven't been into a garden, and they've been told that it's kind of dirty out there and you need boots. Well, after 20 years of, I guess, word of mouth and trying it, they almost want to go out there barefoot. 
Now, the great thing that we have on our side is nature. It's nature. So when they're down there planting the seeds, they're eating the raspberries. They're looking at the beautiful flowers. They learn the name of every edible flower. First thing, first thing, every edible flower. And they are actually eating them as they're doing this. It's all about project-based learning, all about that. And it's about mentorship as well, the older kids teaching the younger kids. Now we do, we do something else that's, that I think is terribly important. And that is that in the kitchen classroom, and again, it might be a math class, it could be a science class, it could be a reading class and they're writing recipes. It could be a dramatic arts class and they're doing improvisational cooking. There is not one academic subject that can't be learned more easily and beautifully and deliciously than, than through the experience of, of the garden and the kitchen, in the garden and in the kitchen. So those are our classrooms. But um, just to get more time for school lunch, we are dreaming up this idea of school lunch as an academic subject, okay? We want academic minutes. So we started playing around with placemats. And this is the civilization of the Americas, history. So we put them down at the place and we cook the food of that, of that place, that country. Okay, I'll pass these around so that you can see them up, up close and we're doing the Silk Road, and we're serving Chinese food. But from the, very, from the very beginning, it was always to get the students to help to serve and to help to take care of the cafeteria. Now, I dreamed up and was allowed to help inform the rebuilding of the cafeteria at King's School because I thought we would be allowed to complete this edible education program by uh, building a space where every child could sit down and eat at long tables, where school lunch would actually become an academic subject. Every child would eat the same delicious, organic, local food at school, okay? They built this cafeteria according to our specifications. And it's really different, like you were saying, the space is unlike other spaces. It has a kitchen where this beautiful, with tiles in the kitchen, where the people who work there can see the people who are in the dining room. It's an open kitchen. And the dishwashing area looks especially beautiful with tiles because they are the most abused and we want to elevate the idea of the workers in the kitchen. We made a beautiful space in the back of the kitchen because the farmers come in that way, and we put it, we imagine a table right in front of the wood oven where we could feed the farmers when they brought the food in. We made great lighting in the dining room, and we thought that the eighth graders could help to serve a lot of the younger kids that were at the tables because we know one thing, abs we know two things absolutely from 20 years. If kids grow it and cook it, they all eat it. And I'm sure, Richard, you know that. I learned the second thing that if older children or other children are serving it to them, they want to eat it too. And so I want to use that idea that they are serving each other, that they're empowered to do this work. They're able to use sharp knives. They're able to use equipment in the kitchen. It really lifts them up. And I, I say by the time they graduate from eighth grade, they could all give a TED talk. 
they could, they could all give it to you because they've learned the principles of harmony. They know about sustainability. They deeply have digested nourishment. There's no resistance to masa rice, brown rice. They love to do that, but only if it's tasty. Now, taste is the major factor about school food. And the food that we are getting, I have rarely in my whole experience of looking into this for 20 years, I have rarely gone into a school in any country where the food smells and tastes good. Only one time they were roasting uh, squash in a school in Washington, D.C., and, and you could smell it out, and the kids were just, what is that roasting squash? And they were looking forward to eating a meal at school. But why does the food not taste good? And I think it comes from the fact that, very sadly, that we've never, ever really learned to cook in this country for all the right reasons. We were Puritans coming over. We didn't believe in the table. We didn't have deep gastronomic roots, except some in the South. We grown food for quantity, not for taste. Uh, we've never, it was always drudgery, certainly from the 50s on. Uh, we got every piece of equipment we can get. As soon as we could get frozen food, we had it. We had TV dinners. I saw it all come in. And it is shocking the way that this fast food culture, and it goes right to the indoctrination. They have taken over all of our terms, everything. Natural, sustainable, beautiful, uh, uh, communal. Uh, every one cage-free, grass-fed, and they put their own twist on it. And so we have to be so clear, and we have to be so right, and, um, and we have to be so together on our resolve. We are up against a kind of... of I, uh, a just shocking, inhuman behavior that we have to be so kind and sh generous and we have to be giving food away. We have to be holding hands with our neighbors. We have to be picking people. We have to go back to the values that I felt in the 60s. You know, we have to do things they would never do. You know, come on over and stay at my house. You know, we have to we have to really figure out a way that we can demonstrate these human values. And I'm so pleased that you gathered the the British over here to help us. <laughs> <laughs> I know Alice. we left you in the beginning, and only Jefferson was out there. <laughs> but, Al uh, Alice, I, have, I mean, as somebody who's been following a bit been an observer and a participant of the food movement for a few decades now i'm just wondering are you seeing real change are you optimistic at all are you i mean how how are you feeling about where things are going and where we're at okay and speak right into the mic. right into the mic right here uh, you know i am incredibly hopeful I'm incredibly hopeful because of all the young people who really get this deeply, and I mean deeply from six years old, probably even before that, who are able to speak up, but I mean all the way up and into the 30s. I mean, these are our kids, and they know. Um, and they know it from the global internet communication that's happening now, but we... Um, uh, decided at the, at the uh, about four years ago to try to collect on our website, the Edible Schoolyard Project, all of the schools that were doing something in terms of gardening, cooking, or curriculum. 
uh, K through 12 mostly, but really into college as well. Now, this is what we collected out of, of two years ago, and this is only 3,500 from around the world, 3,500. But since then, in the last two years, we have collected 2,000 more. So it's multiplying geometrically. Now, these are only people that put their information into the website. It's not people that I know. I meet them all the time. Oh, I have a gardening program. I didn't know you were doing anything. So it's not anybody like that. And it doesn't include slow food from Italy, which has its own thousand schools in Italy. But this is a movement about coming back to our senses. It really is coming back to, to deep feelings that we've had since the beginning of civilization. We want to eat together. We want to take care of the land because that's where our food comes from. We, we love celebrating the harvest. We actually love children. We love old people. We, we have been really, we have been lost in this and now we're finding ourselves and it's so, I call it a delicious revolution. Mm -hmm. Well, we have to change school food. We, one in three kids in America who are overweight or obese. And diabetes is rampant. I mean, we, ha we don't have a choice. If we care about the f our future generations, we have to make some radical changes. Um, we should probably open it. We have a few minutes left. We have, I think, 20 minutes left to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, raise your hand and just you, we'll bring your microphone. Yes, please. I have two questions. Uh, one is for you, Lord. So, uh, is education and that is given what you've learned about addiction uh, of like sugar. Isn't it more educating children about brainwashing and advert and advertisement? Should we and brainwashing and advertising? and brainwashing children. Advertising brainwashes children. And what's the question? How do you combat that? Advertising and brainwashing of kids with, I mean, how do we combat that? Anybody want to take that on? Um, is it I bad in you, England uh, as it is here? Well, just to give you a quick response to that, um, I think teaching and learning has too often been about uh, objectives. Teacher tells the children what they're going to learn. Uh, what we did a few years ago, and it's radically shifted the way we learn, is we ask questions. Uh, so inquiries, or I think you call them slightly different in in inquiries, yeah. uh, are, are the big picture questions, but then you go into the detail, and obviously a skilled teacher asks really good questions. So the more we shift to a questioning culture, the more we challenge the status quo of what's happening, and, and hopefully our children start to really think about uh, and question themselves, is this working? Do we agree with this? Is this right? Alice? I, I, I think we have to have all advertising out of the schools, period. None. Absolutely none. I've, I, I, we were having a big discussion about this at UC Berkeley because of the Global Food Initiative that's happening. And uh, they've set up a new cafeteria that wants to serve lo you know, local real food on the campus. But there is big advertising on the wall of this good food. And I, I mean, you're assaulted. Instead of by 
a kind of beautiful environment that, that conceivably the students could create. There are the billboards, even for Pete's Coffee, selling organic coffee. We don't need that. We need to learn about word of mouth, that if something is good, people will come to it. I mean, I see it over and over and over again. I mean, we have never advertised at Chez Panisse, ever advertised, never paid for advertising at the restaurant. And I think we have to, it's almost like an underground movement is happening, and it is word of mouth, about farm to table restaurants around the country. You just hear it, you ask your friends, and they say, oh, we know this one and that one and that one. Well. We have to take it out of the schools, and I mean for athletics, for everything. People are shameless uh, industry in thinking that they need a return for what they give to the school. Well, I, I urge everybody, next time you're in a hospital, <laughs> count the uh, Coca-Cola clocks, the Coca-Cola um, refrigerators at colleges on university campuses, I mean, start counting the times you, I mean, you don't even see it anymore because it's so ingrained. And um, start counting those. And I think pushback is a really important thing that has to happen. Like, why, you're a hospital. Why, why are you advertising Coca-Cola? Why do you have vending machines? Why MCAs? You know, these kids are killing themselves exercising and they come down, there's a snack thing. There's, there's soda being sold in YMCAs across America. The Girl Scouts of America selling their logo to Nestle. So, you know, when a kid's in a supermarket with a mom and, and she goes, oh, there's, there's my Girl Scout logo. Let's buy that chocolate and strawberry milk. I mean, there's, there's that, there, the public has to really start being fed up with that. And that's not a plug for my film. But if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. Yes, Angela. Right, can I speak to that as well? Um, I think when we think about competitive foods, especially within schools, um, they provide a really valuable revenue source for schools. Um, and that's why you oftentimes see, you know, these sodas or, you know, chips or snacks um, competing with the school meal program. And I think to get to the heart of that, we need to increase funding for school, school meal programs. We need to increase our funding to schools. We need to, like, think about food as a valuable resource to our communities um, and something that we need to invest in, especially when we think about schools. So that way they don't have to turn to other routes and invite people in. Not, I don't know if they do it with ill intentions, you know, to, but I think... It, it becomes almost a necessary evil. But if we were to increase funding for our school mill programs, increase funding for our schools, then you know we wouldn't be leaving them out there to have to fend for themselves. But I would say, because I'm a little older than you and a little more cynical, that the you know part of the goal of these companies is to get the customer as young as they can, and you know set them up for life. So I think there is um, conscious intention to infiltrate schools across the country, for sure. Alice, you want to add to that? Well, I just have to add that we have to go right to the place of free school lunch for every child in this country from farms and producers who are taking care of the land. And there's no compromise. And it's I have a suggestion as to how yes, to do dear. that. I know you do. And, and my <laughs> suggestion, and I'd like to hear from the panel if they have any opinions, or from you guys, that how do we pay that free, real food for schools? Well, we pay it with the soda tax. Yep. Okay, a we soda do. tax goes to free school food. And this to me is such a no-brainer. Yeah. That And we're, you know, we're the food movement, guys. And if we can't get behind a very simple idea like this, I don't know how anyone else is going to get behind it. I mean, it's a, a basic idea, tax the soda, and give the money to the schools for real fresh food. And they're doing it in England, and they're doing it in Mexico, by the way. It's working in Mexico. Richard, um, talk to us about how it's working in England. So you'll all know Jamie Oliver. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and Jamie Olive, Oliver really wanted to shake up school foods in England. Um, and he then passed the baton on to two guys who run a, a series of restaurants in London. Um, and they created something called the School Food Plan. And the school food plan was people in catering, in nutrition, in food research, head teachers and principals and so on. Uh, and that group came together and put forward a proposal to the government to introduce universal infant free school meals, four to seven year olds, uh, all getting a free meal every day 
uh, generally a hot, nutritious meal. Uh, and to their credit, the government, it was the coalition government, the last government in England, they said, we'll do it. It costs 1.9 billion pounds a year, and it's in over 16,000 schools. Uh, and it has transformed not just the food culture, but you'll all understand the learning culture because our children are now all eating well at lunchtime and it's also going into breakfasts and it's changing the way our children can learn. So uh, a little while back there was a suggestion that it might be pulled, the funding might be pulled, and there was absolute uproar from parents, schools and other members of parliament. So it's, it's still going. Uh, the hope is that it will go right through to 11, the whole of the elementary years, um, and that's still on the cards. So it's re so to give you some reassurance, it's possible, and we did it in about a year and a half. How much of it is organic? Uh, good <laughs> question. Uh, they they've gone for the healthy option, you know, the fresh fruit and vegetables, uh, trying to be seasonal, trying to be local. Uh, I would say, Alice, unfortunately, there's not a lot of organic. We've really pushed that in my school, but it is the exception at the moment. Well, it's, I think it should be part of the criteria for the buying of food for schools. And to do it right at the beginning, where there's no, uh, uh, there's uh, again, no compromise about that because we really need to lift up the farmers who are taking care of the land and lift up the teachers because those two groups of people are the ones that feed us. And I think we don't respect uh, public education anymore. We have allowed it to be taken over by the fast food culture, and the farmers are struggling. So if we go directly to the organic farmers, we could put people into farming. We could have this amazing back to the land movement where they know it's like school-supported agriculture, where they know they're going to make money if they grow that crop. Now, how amazing could that be? Can how I amazing? just add one other thing, which is uh, you might want to look at the School Food Plan website. It's a very useful website. It's got a lot of information on it. The other thing is we have something called the um, Food for Life program. And if you get gold, food for life, you are using organic ingredients. Okay. Oh, so that's for schools, but it's also for caterers. So you can go from bronze to silver to gold. Schools and caterers want to do that. If you look on the Food for Life website, you'll see all their criteria to get you up to gold level. It's very, Beautiful. very helpful. Any questions or comments from our lovely audience? Now's your chance. Yes. Ted, you want to take that? Uh, so um, our mayor, uh, Mayor Greg Fisher, is uh, a thousand percent behind this project. So, you know, not only do we have this sort of the university, you know, industrial grade research, you know, it's all pure and wonderful, um, but, you know, it also comes with this social signaling that this is really important that we do this. So, you know, we're, we're in a community where we have a strong mayor form of government. It's a 750,000 person community. It's one media market. And so everybody understands that this is an important thing that we're doing. And quite frankly, they're surprised because we have a, a robust private school system. This is the first time the private school system has lagged our public schools. And so now we've had this sort of hurry up, like they're all sort of doing their sort of knockoff, which is fine, imitation's a great thing. Um, and so, you know, I, I think a lot of this work, and we heard it from Los Angeles and all that, the, if you can have, you know, I, I'm a strong advocate for local government. If you can have local elected officials, you know, who really are supposed to represent, you know, the, the people of the community, really being involved. And, you know, I'm not saying that they have to be experts at it and that, they, you know, sort of to meddle with it or whatever, but I am saying um, a lot of times a lot of activists don't spend the time because they just imagine government's part of the problem. And, you know, half the time you're right, but the other half of the time it's a missed opportunity. And so I would just throw that out there. Like, it's been super important for this project to have that social signaling on top of it all. And I know Prince Charles does yeah, that. That's, we've, that's what we do, like right? the Prince of Wales. 
We do. We do like him. Now, he's <laughs> not government. Like he's royalty. But yeah, you know, it's well, a similar. No, that's why we left. That's why we left. <laughs> but a progressive, a progressive mayor. We've heard that a, a lot during this conference. How important yes. a progressive mayor um, can be to influencing programs. Alice, did you want to add anything? No, Angela? I was just going to put up a cheer for Prince Charles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Angela wants to comment on that. Yeah, and so I think with us, our superintendent has been an incredibly vocal advocate for the school meal program. I'll do your it again. Sorry about that. Our your superintendent. superintendent. Yes, our superintendent has been an incredible vocal advocate for the school food program. He is a huge supporter of our breakfast in the classrooms, meaning that we're serving our students a breakfast. They come into their classroom and there's a breakfast waiting on them. Um, so he has been a huge supporter. But the reason why it's on his radar as well is because it also has come from our students. It's come from our school communities. Um, and we've chosen to listen to them and respond to them. Um, so I think as we think about communities, it's so interconnected. Like our infrastructure within our schools don't allow us to do from scratch cooking within our schools. That's going to be a massive investment to get our kitchens up to a standard to be able to do from scratch cooking within our schools. But then we were able to find a partner um, within our community, right across the Bay in Oakland, um, who is able to provide us those high quality, uh, excuse me, nutrient rich foods for our schools. Um, and it's just about bringing awareness to the value of food and the impact it has on our bodies and on our students, especially who are growing. Um, their brains need that in order to become healthy brains that are going to take in everything that's going on in the classroom. Um, so it's just really about putting that message out there and really making sure that it's heard. Well, it's just uh, hard to uh, hear the messages when you have a culture that is hijacking your terms all the time. We don't know what's healthy. And that word is, is just, from my point of view, lost. I mean, uh, I'm just gone. I mean, I don't really believe that we have come up with any ideas for a really good, healthy school lunch. I'm, I, that's where I'm focused right now, that we can actually brainstorm this and bring together chefs who have these ideas, the abilities to, to, to make food tasty. And um, I, I think we can do this, uh, but it's, it's so different from that pyramid <laughs> that I can't even begin to talk about it. I mean, we need food that meets the criteria not, a, not only of good, clean, and fair, but one that meets the criteria of easy to make, uh, uh, something that is really seasonal, something that's available to people all around the country and around the world. I mean, spices are just kind of amazing. And there are affordable foods that have been made in countries, again, uh, for for reasons of nourishment that that are that we can learn about and bring them back in, uh, but uh, but I think the great way to do this might be to offer, put that criteria out there and offer a big old cash prize, whoever comes up with a recipe, for the schools, that meets this criteria. We're both educating the public about it. And then we're building the repertory of recipes because the kids have to like it too. That's part of the criteria. And uh, I, it's very much about portion control. And the only way you can get portion control is really when you're serving it out and everyone is having the same amount. And it's a beautiful thing to teach, I mean, they teach it in French schools. They, they do it very arbitrarily there because they do it according to, to calories. And they figure it out that way. Uh, I'm figuring it in another. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I, I just think that, again, one of the big uh, problems we have is we believe that more is better. We have been told that more is better. And there was a very interesting uh, fast food company that in the United States and in England. And in England, they were serving less food for the same price. Less food for the same price. And people were going for it. It's, 
Uh, it's kind of crazy thing that has happened in this country is that more is better and the obesity epidemic is the manifestation of that. Just, just one final uh, point Sorry. on that. I think we need to be opening our doors much more in a school context, uh, bringing parents into school, uh, getting them to experience food, uh, getting our farmers to come in uh, and talk to our children, getting allotment growers to come in. Um, I think schools, from my perspective, are still very narrow about what education's about. It's what you do in a classroom in a school. And actually, we've got so many people in our community that we can teach and who can teach us. Uh, and children are great ambassadors for sharing this message, aren't they? So, you know, let's, let's just get out there and, and share the messages. Yeah. I want to thank our esteemed panel. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And I hope you're as inspired as I feel. And we can do it and we will do it. Thank you so much.